and gentlemen. I hope this works. Yes, it does. Um, I'm Simon May, and my conversation partner is Henry Hardy. And uh, I've been asked by the organizers to tell you that uh, there will be a book signing afterwards in the Battle Bridge room on the ground level upstairs. So just so you know. Um, and so we're, 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 here, we're here today to talk about one of the great minds of the 20th century of philosophy, Isaiah Berlin, and actually also about Henry Hardy, because Henry Hardy had a, I think for an editor, an absolutely unique relationship to Isaiah Berlin in that he didn't merely edit his works, he was in a sense the midwife to his works, and even one could say he had some co-paternity. Um, I mean, it, when you read this book, which, I've, which I did for this session, I, had not, I hadn't realized myself, though I was a, I've been a lifelong admirer of Berlin's writings, how involved Henry was in the process of not only cajoling Berlin to write, and to actually get stuff down on paper, which he was remarkably reluctant to do, given that volumes and volumes have appeared, uh, but also to think through his ideas. And there are frequent challenges like, do you really think that's coherent, Isaiah? You know, <laughs> what about you know, the competition between these two values? Have you thought that through? Anyway, it was, it's, it's, he really does have a remarkable, and I think unique, I mean, I was trying to think who else, you know, Boswell and Dr. Johnson or um, Eckermann and, and Goethe, but nobody, as far as I know, really, they might have edited the great man's works or they might have written biographies of them, but the idea that they really were involved at every stage in the process of creation, I think, is certainly, as far as I know, pretty much unique. So this is as much about, or almost as much, about Henry Hardy as it is about Isaiah Berlin. Now, for those of you, because some people here might not have seen Isaiah Berlin in action, I mean, either in reality or on film, we decided to show a short clip because it's not just the substance of what he says, it's the way he says it is so unique uh, that if you haven't seen it, you know, you're not really in a position to see why hopefully what we're going to say is of such relevance. <laughs> um, so if the film is ready, can we show it? I want to just say where it comes from, if okay. that's all right. Yeah. Um, it's a clip from a series of conversations which Brian McGee had with philosophers in the late 70s, and it was called Men of Ideas, originally. And uh, he spoke to famous philosophers of his time, uh, of the time, about um, their own ideas, so it was centered on the ideas of the people that he was interviewing. But he began, the first program was called An Introduction to Philosophy, and he began by talking to Isaiah and asking him what philosophy was all about, what was the point of being a philosopher, what were philosophical questions like. And in the course of this conversation, he said to Isaiah, some people have suggested that philosophical questions are like the questions asked by children. Is that how you see it? And this clip is his reply to that question. I hope. Should we just, should we just go down? Yes, by all means. Yeah. This isn't working, so I'm going to try this one. We tested it before, and it worked fi fine. Um, there's a, there's a law of IT, which is Hardy's law, which says <laughs> that whatever you do, the IT will go wrong. And here it is, proved again. <laughs> ask these no. questions, and I know this. They say, um, they don't say what is time, they don't say that. But what they say is, uh, why can't I read the poem? Supposing a child said that, seems quite a natural thing for a child to do. And you say, you can't, he's dead. And then you say, well, why, why, is this, why does this prevent one? And then if the father is sophisticated, he has to explain that the death means uh, his body becomes dissolved in the ground, he can't be resurrected, it happened a long time ago. Um, and, and then if the child is at all sophisticated, a sophisticated child would say, well, can't all the bits be brought together again? And then the father says, no, no, they can't. What kind of can't? And then the lesson in physics follows. And the child says, no, 
Well, you can't, Sister Carla. Why not? Because you can't go back in time. Why can't I? Then we have philosophical problems. What is meant by can't? <laughs> is not being able to move back in time the same sort of can't as when you say price book can't be set? Or the same sort of can't as when you say uh, you can't buy cigarettes at 2 o'clock in the morning because of the low gates? Or I can't remember. Or uh, I, I can't make myself nine foot tall and then you wouldn't wish me. What sort of can't? What sort of must? And then we're done with the philosophy just straight away. And then you have to say, well, the nature of time. And then some people say, no, no, there isn't such a thing as time. Time is just a word for before and after and simultaneously with to talk about time as if it's a kind of thing is a metaphysical trap. And we're approached. Well, most of our fathers don't want to ask the question of the truth. Well, they just tell them to shut up and not ask silly questions, go in time a tree, as it were. But these are the questions which constantly recur, and philosophers are the people who are not terrified of them and are prepared to deal with them. The children, of course, ultimately are conditioned not asking these questions. More is the pity. The children who are not so conditioned turn into philosophers. I was always looking for a reason not to have grown up. I think I found it. Yeah. Um, one can see from this clip why um, Isaiah Berlin was said to have received his knighthood for services to conversation, because <laughs> he just was just, just u unique in that sort of rapid-fire exchange. So, Henry, can you tell us, start off by telling us a little bit about his life and where he came from and how it shaped, perhaps most interestingly, how it shaped the kind of questions he asked, the kind of philosophical questions he asked? Isaiah was born in Riga, the capital of Latvia as it now is, then it was part of the Russian Empire in 1909. His, his mere existence is a sort of miracle because the year before he was born, his mother had had a stillborn daughter after an appallingly long and difficult labor and her gynecologist had told her that she would never have children after that. Nevertheless, she did bear Isaiah the following year. He too was a difficult birth and was extracted uh, with a pair of calipers which damaged his left arm. And uh, so that was one miraculous station on, on, on the journey of his life. Then in 1941, the Germans who had taken over uh, Latvia murdered all of his family, all his relations, except for one or two who had gone to different parts of the world. Some had gone to Israel, for example, or Palestine, as it then was, of course. And um, he, by that time, uh, was in England, so he had been in England for some time. He'd, he'd emigrated. And if he hadn't emigrated, then he too would have been killed. So there are two, at least two turning points in his life where his existence was under threat uh, and where it was remarkable that he survived. His father was a, a timber merchant um, whose main trade was selling timber to the Russian railways, sleepers for the Russian railway system. But he also had interests in other parts of the world, including England, um, which gave him an, an escape route, uh, which was taken advantage of in 1920, when, uh, in, sorry, in 1921, when the family emigrated to England from Latvia, uh, where they had returned to after a spell in, in Russia proper, living in Petersburg. Um, so Isaiah came at the age of 11 to England. He was, he was, as he always said, a Russian Jew, and he claimed that he remained a Russian Jew all his life. He said he loved England, he was an Anglophile, but he never became an Englishman in the full sense. Although, to the outsider, he appeared to be as, as much a part of the British establishment as almost anybody could be. Uh, he had a knighthood, he had the Order of Merit, he was a professor at Oxford, he founded an Oxford college, he lived in Oxford most of his life. He, was a representative of the British government in America during the war. In every conceivable way, he was 
British through and through in his, in his behavior, if you like, but he said inwardly he always remained the Russian Jew that he began by being, and he never felt that he became a proper Englishman, although he loved England really deeply and admired its qualities. So uh, that was the beginning of his life. Uh, he, he, went, he came to England and went to a prep school in Surbiton to start with in 1920, uh, 1921, and then uh, eventually went to St Paul's School, a public school uh, in London, from where he tried to get into Balliol College, Oxford, was turned down for a scholarship, was turned down for a place uh, when he tried the second time, and then he got in as a scholar at Corpus Christi College, um, which uh, is to the credit of that college, as opposed to Balliol, I feel. <laughs> he did a degree in classics, um, greats as it was called, and got a first in that. And then he did a degree in PPE in one year after that, politics, philosophy, and economics, and got a first in that too. Then he was the first Jew ever to be elected to All Souls College in Oxford as a prize fellow which was a remarkable event at the time, featured in the Jewish Chronicle and elsewhere. <laughs> he uh, got, got a fellowship which lasted for seven years, and uh, he decided eventually that he would write a biography of Karl Marx, which, which he was asked to do by uh, the editors of a series called the Home University Library. Um, and he did that, and that was published in 1939, just before the war began. He then spent some years in America during the war working for British information services, working for the Foreign Office. He was famous for writing uh, extremely scintillating summaries of American political opinion based on newspapers, based on talking to people. He was, uh, we were talking just now about conversation, he knew everybody who was anybody in New York and Washington and uh, he wrote these amazing dispatches weekly. They were technically written by the British ambassador, uh, Lord Halifax, but everybody knew that he wrote them himself and they became celebrated in the circles where they were read in England, including Winston Churchill, who thought they were wonderful, although slightly perfervid as he uh, described it, which I think is a good way of describing Isaiah's way of talking. And at the end of the war, he went to Russia on a, a trip which he'd longed to make for some time, where he met, uh, he was supposed to be writing a, a kind of account of Soviet foreign policy, and he was sent because he had fluent Russian, Russian was his first language, and he, sp he spoke Russian fluently, as we may be able to illustrate in a minute. Um, and there he met writers, Russian writers, in particular Boris Pasternak, and Anna Akhmatova. And the encounter in particular with Anna Akhmatova is very famous. He talked to her all night. Uh, he returned to his hotel in the morning and threw himself on the bed and said, I am in love, I am in love. <laughs> Although, in fact, they, they never touched, according to him, and I believe him. They, they sat in opposite corners of the room and just talked and talked about literature and poetry and their lives and their loves. And, they just clicked in the most amazing way. There's a sort of mythology that's grown up a, around that meeting. After the war, he returned to Oxford and uh, became eventually the Chichely Professor of Social and Political Theory at All Souls in 1957. He did that for 10 years. Then in 1966, in just before he finished that posting, he founded Wolfson College Oxford, which is a College for Graduate Students, and which still exists and thrives and is very much in his image. It's a very egalitarian, open, unstuffy place uh, where I myself w went to do postgraduate work, which is where I met him in 1972. He retired from that in 1975, and that was the end of his formal career, if you like, but he lived for another 22 years after that. And during all that time, I was working with him on the writings which eventually appeared under his name. <laughs>
I think that's the main thread of his life. If there's any part of it that I've left out no, or you want to say more about. That's great. I mean, say? it would be interesting if you could say I, uh, something about, I read in your book, you, you say, um, you cite, I mean, as you said, he knew all these extraordinary people, Winston Churchill, and one of them was Heim Weizmann. Mm -hmm. And you say that in a letter to him, that you sent him, you cited something that he had said of Heim Weizmann mm. to express your own appreciation of him. Mm. And I, I just quoted, you say, my association with you has been in all my life the thing in which I felt more pride and moral satisfaction than anything else whatever, not to speak of the personal pleasure and sense of justification for one's existence, which it provided and still provides. Mm. And I just wanted to ask you, you know, what it was about him, uh, perhaps particularly his ideas. I mean, mm. we can see what an extraordinary personality he was. But what was it about him to make you want to devote really your entire professional life to him? I mean, that is so unusual. It is unusual. Yes, it was a it was a serendipitous co conjunction of circumstances that led to us being put together, as it were. Um, as soon as I met him, the first time I met him, which was was being interviewed for a position at Wolfson College for for a graduate scholarship. I could see, I sensed immediately that he was a really exceptional man, unlike anyone I'd ever seen, and I hope I'm right in thinking that that comes out from a clip like the one we've seen. Um, he was unconventional, he was, he was terrifically engaged, obviously personally, in what he was asking, and it wasn't a kind of um, mechanical, bureaucratic interview of the kind that no doubt most of us have been through many times in our careers. He asked me, what I was going to do for my thesis, what subject I was going to study for my thesis. And when I told him, <coughs> instead of asking me to explain in some dry way what the arguments were or what I was trying to establish, he said, oh, are people still interested in that? <laughs> which was... What was your proposal about? Oh, I wanted to write about Wittgenstein's private language argument, which... Uh, was a, a, had been discussed, Much discussed. a great deal uh, by then, and most people felt that, 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 that it, it had the last drop of blood wrung out of it. Um, anyway, um, and also he was um, late for a lunch appointment, and every two questions he hopped up from his seat and went over to the window to see if the taxi had come. <laughs> and that, that also rather threw me, so it was very unsafe. Yes. Was there something about his ideas? I mean, did you have some burning question to which you felt he might have, if not no. the answer, some insight that you desperately needed? Or was no. it just the magnetism of his personality? No, I knew nothing about him or his work when I met him. Um, but, but I got to know people in the college who knew about him, and I asked what I should read in right. order to, in order to um, find out something about his ideas, and I was recommended to read Four Essays on Liberty, which was published in 1969. That's three years before I met him. And I did read it uh, in the next vacation, uh, and I was completely bowled over by it. And uh, I think other people have had the same experience. It seemed to me that here was somebody who, first of all, was uh, engaged with ideas in a really human way that, that didn't treat them as dry abstractions, that was interested in what light they threw on, on human life, how they could be used to enable us to understand the human condition more. Uh, well, perhaps you, could, perhaps you could say in this context, you know, how that essay was influenced by his origins in some way. I mean, the, so what I mean by that is, you know, Anglo-Saxon liberalism would typically talk about the negative liberalism. So yeah. two S's on liberalism, there's negative liberalism, which in short is freedom from external coercion, mm -hmm. and then there's positive liberty, which is the freedom to, which is an internal thing. It's a, it's a matter of self-control, self-discipline, and is very identified with continental philosophy, especially with the philosophy of Kant, of course, originally. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted, perhaps you could just give us a sense for, you know, how his origins affected his philosophy. I mean, si since you've mentioned the the essays on liberty, perhaps that would be one place to start. Yes, you ask difficult questions. Um, his, his experience in the, in the Soviet Union was formative. He uh, tells a story of being out 
walking with his governess in the course of the first of the Russian revolutions. And he saw uh, a man who had been dragged down off a rooftop. It was a, a Tsarist policeman who had been trying to uh, shoot at the revolutionaries. And it seemed to him that he was being dragged off to a most unpleasant fate, no doubt to be killed, I think. And uh, he had a terrifically strong personal response to that. And um, that, as it were, inured him to communism and all its works from that point onwards mm. in a way that his contemporaries in England uh, took some time to catch up with. And he used to say that if he'd been told at the time that he was trying to leave the Soviet Union, which he did with his parents in 1920, if he'd been told that because he was born as a Soviet citizen, he would have to stay in, Soviet, in the Soviet Union for the rest of his life, what would his reaction be? And he said, no question, only one thing I would do, I would blow my brains out. <laughs> and that shows how mm. great his horror was of totalitarianism, in particular uh, Soviet totalitarianism. And I, the, the, the lecture called Two Concerts of Liberty is very much, if you like, a philosophical commentary on um, Soviet totalitarianism. And it says that um, the Soviet system is built on the, um, what he calls the monstrous impersonation, the false argument that the experts running the Soviet Union know much more about what you really want than you know yourself. They know what's good for you, they know what you ought to want, and even if you in fact think you want something completely different, you're wrong. You should defer to the experts. So they do what Rousseau called forcing you to be free. They have a, an idea of freedom which in fact means subjection to their requirements, which is in fact the exact opposite of freedom. So mm. if you like, you can see the, the, the lecture as an impassioned defense of true human freedom, which means being left alone to make your own choices, to form your own identity, uh, uh, to make your own decisions against this false uh, distortion of freedom by the Soviet authorities. And can you say something about the conclusions he drew from that in terms of you know, his, his, his master thought, which, I mean, would I, would I be right in summarizing his, in fact, one could seldom summarize the master thought of any philosopher, but I think in the case of Isaiah Berlin, one can. And would, would it be correct to say that his master thought is the idea that all the great ends of life, which you know, philosophers and sages and theologians have talked about for centuries, it is just not possible to have any society in which all great things can be combined. So that human existence is necessarily tragic in the sense that one has to make choices mm. and you have to sacrifice ends that are noble, good, and that you would love to pursue, but they're simply not compatible with other great mm. ends. Would it be fair to say that that was the master thought of his and that followed from this experience in Russia? I don't think that follows directly. I think he was pluralism, or what you just described is Plural, known as, value he called it pluralism, and it's generally described by other people as value, value pluralism, pluralism, which is the idea that all human beings pursue these conflicting values and that we have conflicts between them in the way that you've described. But I think that's quite separate from uh, his devotion to freedom. I think the two mutual, are mutually supportive, but I think... Uh, you could say there's another master idea, if you like, which in a way is, is a more traditional one and perhaps is less original to him, but it's one which he felt with unrivaled passion, which is that free will and the making of choices for yourself is an absolutely essential defining characteristic of human beings and that anybody who tries to diminish this or push you around in any way to stop you mm. creating your own life and your own personality and, and forging your own way in the world, anybody who, who does anything to diminish that is evil, really. So, and then pluralism uh, supports that because it, it's a picture of, uh, of a whole range of different opportunities that are open to people. People can develop in so many different ways. They can be utterly different and still wonderful human beings. This is something which is conveyed very well by his book, which is called Personal Impressions, in which he gives 
pen portraits, if you like, of, of a, a range of people. One of his great skills was to see the point of and describe what the world looked like from inside a whole range of different people. And uh, they really are very different people. They're astonishingly different. Um, Akhmatova was one of them, Winston Churchill was another, Roosevelt was another, uh, Virginia Woolf was another, I could go on. And they're all, they're all they don't, as it were, he's not uh, showing how they all um, exemplify one correct way of being human. He's showing that there are astonishingly different ways of being human, all of which are exciting and important, and any, any system of any kind, whether it be religious or political, which tries to narrow down the options uh, available to us and, and force us all into one a narrow, narrow way of living our lives must be resisted. He, he was a terrific, he was, I sometimes think of him as the patron saint of untidiness. He, he, he didn't like uh, any kind of uh, system that, 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 that regimented people and, and tried to make them correspond to some blueprint by some theorist about what life should be like. But presumably there was one value that for him was not about which one couldn't be pluralistic, and that was liberty. Exactly, yes. So it, that, that's true, yes. He thought that liberty was, in general, by default, the most important thing. There were, there were occasions when other things were more important. For example, in wartime, in order to make uh, the country that was a war, a more effective uh, opponent to the enemy, you had to suppress people's liberties in ways that you wouldn't normally dream of doing. But sure. that was always a regrettable necessity and something that should be stopped as soon as it possibly could. But where does, I mean, what would have, you know, today we are faced with a situation where we have all these authoritarian regimes around the world. You know, mm -hmm. I, when I was rereading Isaiah Berlin for this conversation, I haven't read him for quite some time. I thought, you know, what would he say to Vladimir Putin? Who would say to him, who would, you know, who would read his thesis on these incompatible different sets of values which one mm. can pursue? And, you know, these are just different ways of life. These are different forms of life. Mm. And, you know, Putin will say, well, my form of life in Russia is suited to the Russian history, Russian temperament. I mean, a little bit like some of the thinkers that Isaiah Berlin venerated, like Herder, who, mm. you know, that, that ideas come out of a history, they come out of a people, they come out of a language. Mm. And they, you know, yes, he'll say, fine, you know, the values I'm pursuing are inconsistent with yours, and they're inconsistent with liberal democracy, but mm. they come out of a great culture. Mm. Uh, would he have had anything to say to that? I mean, would his theory of value pluralism have given any pushback against the Putins of this world? Well, not the pluralism in itself, but another, another portion of his view, which is the view that there is a certain nucleus or core of values which are based in human nature and which all different, everybody should respect simply because we are all human beings and, and therefore we, we have to respect humanity, if you like. And one of the things he would say to Putin, although I'm sure Putin wouldn't even listen, <coughs> is that you mustn't be uh, authoritarian or repressive towards other people. You mustn't, um, you mustn't invade and take over territory of other people, for example. You mustn't compel your citizens to do things which they don't independently want to do. Uh, and a whole range of such things. I mean, the, the idea that, that, that the variation in, in cultures is, is open-ended and indefinite, and there's nothing that, there aren't any minimum requirements that have to be satisfied by any culture is not something he would have sponsored. So that's, that's what he called the minimum moral content of humanity or something of that kind. Mm. And Putin would no doubt be a, a a, a grievous offender against that minim moral minimum. Uh, and just as, you know, the, the Chinese leaders sometimes say, well, you know, it's all very well being liberal Democrats, but we're Chinese and, you know, our, our concepts of, of uh, how to live are quite different from yours, so you can't tell us what to do or what not to do. Well, again, he would say to them, that's fine, but you must respect the minimum requirements of humanity. And you know, locking people up because they disagree with you is a blatant disregard of those. Mm. And, and, but would he have had any answer to them if they said to him, well, you know, tell us why we shouldn't? 
Well, you'd I have mean, our, our society flourishes in this way, so tell us why we shouldn't. Just like, you know, we, we, <coughs> we, we might lock up drug addicts. Mm. Um, well, we, he would have disagreed that the, the society flourishes under those provisions because he would say, look at all these people who, who you have to lock up because they disagree with the way you're running things. Um, so he would certainly mm. disagree with that, but uh, you know the, the, the truth, the, the, the power relationships might be such that he couldn't do anything about it, of course. Yeah, no, I just wonder yes. what his philosophical arguments yes, would be. Philosophically, yeah. he would certainly have things to say against it, and, and did. Mm. Yeah. Can we move on to his relation to Jewish, his Jewish identity into Israel, which mm. I was surprised it doesn't feature much in this book. I mean. There's, there's very little on Israel, for example. Mm. Um, tell us a bit about his relationship to, well, specifically to Israel and to Zionism. Well, there is a bit which you may have forgotten where I, early on, I tried to persuade him to allow me to publish a volume of pieces about Jewish topics, and he um, didn't want to. But in this, in this I feel very... Um, Cautious. Uh, oh, I've felt very cautious with him. When, when Berlin first fell in love with a woman, I think it was the first time he was really deeply in love with a woman. It was called. She was called Patricia Douglas, and his friend, the Oxford philosopher Stuart Hampshire, said, "Here you are, a typical Jew, swarthy Jew, and here, here you are in love with this woman who is super goyissimo." <laughs> It was a very odd relationship. In dealing with his, his relationship to Zionism in Israel, I feel very super goyissimo, so I, 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 that's a kind of caveat before we start. Um, but I feel it's cheeky in a way to, no, but to have views on this, although I do. Um, give us a flavor for his Yes, he was, he was a, what he calls a cradle Zionist. He was brought up uh, to believe in Zionism by his mother in particular, both his mother and father believed in it, but his mother was more impassioned and had a, had a terrific intensity of personal feeling about it. So he said it never occurred to him to, to believe anything else. He imbibed it with his mother's milk. And he, um, as you probably know, justified it in a series of essays, of which the most famous is called Jewish Sla Slavery and Emancipation, which is in one of the books. And he took the view that the uh, creation of the State of Israel was a requirement because every, every people needed a piece of land where they were at home, where they didn't have to feel they were looking over their shoulders at the main inhabitants of a country and wondering if they were doing okay. You know, he said, oh, you, you, you may have thieves, robbers, rapists in Israel, anybody you like. You know, he didn't expect them to be particularly virtuous, but at least it was their country and, and they weren't uh, worrying about how, they, how their behavior would be regarded by the dominant culture. So that was, mm. he, he felt that, had, he said, you, you didn't have to go there. Some, some people would make Aliyah and go there. Other people would, would remain in the diaspora. But the existence of the country solve this particular problem of there being nowhere where Jews felt at home. Mm. And he, he certainly, I mean, this was something he found in, gen, in a more general t uh, terms in Herder, the, the philosopher Herder, whom he uh, admired very much, who, who was a theorist of how everybody needed to belong somewhere. Everybody had to have their own culture where they felt at home. And he thought Zionism was, a, if you like, an intense and particular, particularly strong version of that. Mm. Mm. And um, related to that, you alluded to the point at the beginning about his, his difficulty in feeling totally at home here, totally English. Mm. Um, and yet he came across as the sort of quintessential English establishment figure. I mean, he, 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 he managed to deal with the British establishment in a way that one can hardly, hardly any other academic in the last half century has done, yeah, you know, he, I'm not sure, I mean, how, tell us a little bit about, because it, f I never met him, although I did see him once, uh, I was sitting behind him uh, in a concert, yeah. and he had a sort of the air more of an institution as much as of a person, you mm -hmm. know, he, he was 
had an extraordinary air of dignity, didn't move once in the two hours of this concert. And somehow he presented himself in a manner that made one, at least me, feel uh, he was slightly acting, but maybe that's unfair. And that b behind this facade was uh, bubbled a very different person. You say he didn't move for two hours. Yes, he was. He was. His concentration was absolute. Oh. You know, people fidget and they well, change from you, one. You were behind him. Yeah, I was a kind of row behind him. A couple of well, in the case, him. I don't think you could see that he was yeah. beating the rhythm on his <laughs> okay. knee all the way through. <laughs> That's what he tended okay. to do. <laughs> he was very. He loved uh, the, the sort of old-fashioned classics, if you like, with strong rhythms and so on. So, and he would uh, he would certainly beat rhythms. Um, he was, yes, he was. He, he thought that uh, when he was asked once to fill in a questionnaire for um, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung uh, called the Proust Questionnaire, one of the questions is, you know, what do you think your gravest fault is? And uh, he answered that excessive anxiety to please. And he thought, yeah. that, that, he thought that that was a Jewish uh, failing. And he thought that really? Yes. <laughs> He think that's the use of some of us. He thought that that was something that came of being an alien in another culture, and you wanted to ingratiate yourself with the people who oh, ran the culture. Oh, sort of assimilation. <laughs> it's, it's a sort of assimilationist tactic, if you like. Yes. And uh, so he did, in, in some ways, excessively ape the most extreme manifestations of Britishness. So he always wore a three-piece suit. He always wore a, a watch chain uh, across his front and, uh, and so forth. So, uh, but nobody found this a problem, I don't think. Yeah. But, it, but it, it externally, it did mean that he, the trappings of Englishness were, were something he affected or adopted. I don't know whether this, this is an irreverent thing to say, but one wonders whether a whole dimension of his feeling and so of his thought wasn't in some, in some sense... Um, not suppressed, I'm not sure what the right word is, but that somehow a lot of Isaiah Berlin never came out in his, in this very, because his thought is, as I said, I mean, it is in a way remarkably summarizable. It's not that broad, if I dare say that to you. Mm. I'm um, not sure I'd agree with that, but I, no, I, I no, see why I you might say it. Yes, I uh, see why you might say it. And I always felt, I mean, it'd be interesting perhaps for us to see that clip of him speaking Russian. Do we have time for yes, that? Yes, I think so, yeah. it's, it's very short. I mean, I hadn't seen this until we got in touch, and it's, mm. he's a quite a different person, I think. Okay, let's look, look at that if we can. Я только могу сказать, что самый, поэтому было самое замечательное в моей жизни, моей встрече с ней. Более замечательного в моей жизни никогда не было. То что-то, которое осталось у меня навсегда. Я был счастлив, я был горд, я был очень глубоко и на всю жизнь тронут. Что же еще я могу вам сказать? Well, I don't know whether anyone agrees with that. Perhaps it's the same as in English, but something strikes me as different there. As, as, uh, yes, I, I mean, when yeah. you said that to me before, I didn't immediately uh, agree. I mean, I, I, it may be that I'm too sort of involved and I don't mm. to see it how, how it would come, to come across mm. to you the first time. But he certainly... He certainly, he certainly thought in Russian when it, a lot of the time. Mm. When he went to Russia, he said he thought in Russia and he dreamt in Russian. Really? But in England, he dreamt in English. So Russian was, you know, certainly a, you know, a deeper, if you like, a deeper element in his linguistic psyche mm. than, than English was. And there were, it's interesting, uh, as an editor, I've noticed there are little tiny ticks in his in his prose style which which reveal to me that England English wasn't his first language although this surprises people because he was a master of English prose in a way absolutely um, and ca can I just finally ask you before we open this up to questions mm. um, I mean a, a very unfair question but it's one that you know I did have when I read your book you say you thought he was a genius mm-hmm and I wondered why. Well, I say I'm not asking that skeptically. I just, 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 yes. just, you know, that's a big word to use about anybody. Yes. Well, I, I go through in the book. I go through a number of um, definitions of genius, which he himself adopted at different times. And I conclude in and I conclude in the end that 
he wasn't, I mean, it's some, somebody's a genius at playing the violin, for example, or somebody else is a genius as an athlete, somebody else is a genius as a writer or, or as a singer or, or whatever, as a philosopher even. Um, I, one can think of some examples. What I say at the end, which may sound rather banal, but I think in a way it's, it, it's, it's important, is that he was a genius for being a human being. He was a man who I felt was whose humanity was richer and deeper and broader mm. than that of any other person I've ever met. And uh, talking to him, you had the sense of somebody who understood what human life was, what its potentialities were, what its problems were. And uh, in, in talking about other people, he could see into what sort of people they were, what made them tick, what the point of them was. He was always positive ab about other people, with some exceptions, um, uh, rather than trying to knock them down or criticize mm. them. So you had a, a, a sense of enormous wisdom perception uh, about humanity, and that, that was something that never left me. And uh, to be in his presence and hear him talking was just marvelous, mm. always marvelous. And you, say, and you say that when he died, you felt this sense of, I think the words where you used were debilitating depression, you write in that book. Yes. Uh, it, was, it was the loss of such a yes, unique friend, in a sense. I'm prone to, I was at the time, and anyway, prone to depression anyway, but certainly I took a plunge when he died, and I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure that his death uh, precipitated that, mm. because it was a sense of loss, a very deep sense of loss. But, but the great thing about being able to go on working on his uh, unpublished writings for years after he died was that I felt I was still talking to him. You know, when I look at his manuscripts or his typescripts heavily corrected in manuscript, uh, I could hear his voice as he, as he said the words. Mm. And so I felt he was still alive in a way, and mm. I still feel that now. Mm. Wonderful. Well, sh um, we've got another... Mm. 15 or 16 minutes, so shall we have some questions? Madam, in the front row. No, this, this, this lady. One. Thank you for this very moving description. Um, I felt when he died that I was losing a personal friend, although I'd never personally met him, but heard him and read some of his books. But um, could you say something about his, uh, this humanism that you describe about him? I, I mean, it's, it's very Jewish, if I may say so, and uh, I wonder where it comes from. Can you say a bit about his background? Was he brought up in a secular home, or was there any uh, religious uh, input? To he was, he was uh, brought up not in a... Hmm, it's difficult to answer that. He, he, he is, he is uh, descended from the original founder of Chabad Hasidism, a man called Schneer Zalman. Uh, and, the, and the family was very conscious of, of this tradition and, and, uh, and this family origin. And I, I think he was made aware of it. I mean, he went to, he went to uh, Hebrew tutors and, and so forth. And his mother, uh, I think, was a more of a religious believer than his father was. Um, but his relationship to um, Judaism was more cultural than religious, I would say. And that was partly because of the way he was brought up. I don't think he was compelled to, to be a, a believing Jew, um, although he was certainly made well aware of, of Judaism and the traditions of Judaism. And, uh, so he always felt at home in that tradition. He liked going to synagogue, which he, he did uh, a few times a year, but he was never um, himself a, a believer in the, in the full sense. Um, so I'm not sure I'm really answering your question. Um, he, uh, what more can I say? He said, I've always felt that I'm a Jew in the same sense that I've got two arms and two legs. It doesn't, it's not something I ever questioned or, or, or thought about at all. It was just part of, part of who I am, a deep, deep part of my identity, um, much more so, I think, than, than his Russian identity. I mean, he was living in a, 
in political sense in, in Russia at the beginning of his life, and linguistically he was uh, more Russian than Jewish because his Hebrew was always a bit patchy. Um, you can see from a couple of Hebrew letters that, are, that I've published in his correspondence that his Hebrew was not terribly good. Um, but um, in terms of his personal identity, I think the, the Jewishness was the deepest element. He had this wonderful piece that he wrote uh, when he was given the Jerusalem Prize in 1979 called The Three Strands in My Life. Uh, it's very short, it's only five or six pages, and the three strands are Jewishness, Russianness, and Englishness. And he's got very strong reasons for um, recommending all three and saying how much he values being connected to all three, but you get the very strong sense that the Jewishness is the most important one. You mentioned Akhmatova and the Goyesima friend later on. Is there anything else you can tell us about his private life? <laughs> about his private life? <laughs> what sort of thing do you want to know? Um, he, he, um, he always thought of himself. He had, he had various avuncular relationships to his uh, female pupils when he was a young Don. One of them um, a lady called Rachel Walker fell in love with him and um, proposed marriage to him in the Paris Zoo. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, he turned her down and she subsequently went mad and went into a mental institution. Whether there was any causal, causal relationship <laughs> between the two, I don't, I don't know. I think it probably not. Um, he said that he, for many years, he regarded himself as an ugly, dumpy, swarthy, Jew, uh, no conceivable attract sexual attraction to any conceivable woman. Um, but then, uh, when he was, well, he was born in 1909, so uh, when he was in his 40s, he met um, the Halbans, Aline and Hans Halban, and their marriage was in an unsatisfa unsatisfactory state, and uh, it eventually ended and he married Aline and she was a, a she was a lovely beautiful cultured amazing woman and I think she transformed his sense of himself <coughs> as somebody who could participate in this kind of relationship which was something he had never dreamt of before and from that moment onwards till the very end of his life she was the the anchor the linchpin of his life and created the context in which everything he was and did function from, from that time on. I don't know if that's the sort of thing you mean about his personal life. And I mean, apart from the, the, that, uh, that side of things, there is his amazing capacity for friendship with an enormous variety of different sorts of people. He uh, and, and, and the way in which he could see into the souls of the people that he got to know. So, for example, when he went to America, he'd never been to America before. He went to America in 1940 um, with Guy Burgess in a rather mysterious trip. <laughs> and um, within about a year of being there, if not sooner, everybody regarded him as a greater expert on America than almost anybody else. The, he, he would give accounts of American politics which were breathtakingly insightful, and you know, he, he'd only been there for a short period of time. He, he just had a, a way of absorbing uh, enormous quantities of information and making sense of them. One of his friends was an uh, um, American political commentator called George Kennan, and he once wrote to Isaiah, you, you have a capacity for synthesis, which is the envy of any academic. You know, you can, s you can s see the pattern in the carpet, was the, was the phrase Isaiah used <coughs> himself. And, and he did, for once, although he was very modest and self-effacing in general, he did say, he did admit that he had this capacity. Um, and this gift meant that his range of friends was enormous uh, and the capacity to extract and describe the essence of all these different people was extraordinary. And this, this worked not only in his personal life but also in his uh, 
in his study of the history of ideas, which was his chosen field ultimately. And you, he will talk about people from the past uh, as if he'd met them. Uh, you, know, you feel he's just come in from having tea with Machiavelli or whatever. <laughs> and uh, he, he once said uh, that having worked as he did for five years on Karl Marx, he said he knew exactly what sort of man he was. He was, a, he was um, dour, rather grumpy. He said um, he made heavy German jokes, quite good. Um, uh, he was very interested to know what you thought about his ideas, but he wasn't terribly interested to know what you thought <laughs> about your own ideas and so on. He, he, uh, he, he, and he brought them to life in, in the essay. He wrote a whole series of essays about these thinkers from the past, uh, um, many of which are in a book called Against the Current, but there's lots of others as well, in which he does bring them to life in, in the most extraordinary way. And so um, that's another aspect, if you like, of what was shown in his personal life by his relationship with, to his friends. And you will find people from all walks of life still who, who will talk to you about how marvelous it was to know him and how he, when he talked to you, y you felt that you were the one person that he really wanted to know about. You were really important to him. You felt lifted, if you like. You, you, you felt that you were better and more skillful and more interesting than you really were. So that was a terrific personal gift that he had. So that's another aspect of his personality. I don't know if that is any kind of an answer to your question. <laughs> the lady in the front row. Yes, I wanted to uh, ask, uh, you've talked a lot about his academic prowess. and mm -hmm. uh, um, Did he take part in the Jewish community? Was he involved in any way or... Did he feel himself an outsider? I mean, in Britain, you know. Did you take part in what sort of? In the in in Jewish society, Ju Jewish activities, um, or did he feel that he was an outsider in Britain? No, he certainly did take part in in Jewish activities. Um, he went to Israel regularly. Um, I and meant in, in in the UK. I in meant. the UK, um, yes, he was. Uh, for example, he was on the board of the. Rothschild Scholarships, um, which was a, an organization which gave scholarships to people who wanted to go and study in different parts of the world. Uh, and, and there were some other similar organizations whose names I now can't remember. Uh, so yes, um, but he wasn't uh, obsessively involved, but he, he wasn't, nor did he hold back. I mean, he was just involved in the normal way you would expect a Jew to be, uh, I would say. I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Well, we're talking about, you know, that he was at Oxford and, and, and you know, involved with the academic, mm. academia, if you like. Mm. But, of course, there was a thriving Jewish community, both in London and, you know... Th yes. And, and whether he divorced himself from that or whether he, he was totally immersed in academia and, and, and had no... No, he had lots of, lots of Jewish friends. He was involved in various Jew Jewish organizations and activities, but it wasn't, as it were, a, it wasn't a tunnel vision that, me that meant that everything that he did was related to Jewishness, um, but nor did, he, nor did he turn his face away from it, I mean, uh, I would say. Um, There's a, there are a couple of questions, mm. a couple of gentlemen at the back. Yes. yes. Some, so, some years ago, um, I read, and it's bothered me ever since, <laughs> that Isaiah Berlin himself regarded himself more of a historian of philosophy mm. than being a philosopher who contributed n novel things to philosophy. I just wonder what you think about that. Well, yes, he, he had a story which he told about how he switched from philosophy to the history of ideas. He, he, he began life as part of a group of young uh, philosophers in Oxford um, who did what, what was called ordinary language philosophy or Oxford philosophy. And then <coughs> when he was in America in 1944, he met a man called Schaefer who uh, persuaded him that philosophers didn't add to the sum of human knowledge, that, that, <laughs> that uh, they, you, if you were a philosopher, you didn't know more at the end of your life than you knew at the beginning. <laughs> and he was... With, with, with some exceptions, I think logic and psychology were, were two areas in which you could make progress. And he 
took this on board and obviously agreed with it to some extent and decided, as he said, that he did want to know more at the end, end of his life than he knew at the beginning, and so he switched to the, to the history of ideas. But I think, uh, as, a, as a number of philosophers have observed, what he did really was not to abandon philosophy for history, but to start doing philosophy in a more historical, historically intelligent way, to realise that philosophical questions don't exist in some detached ether, but that they are questions which arise historically and are answered differently in different historical contexts. So he was a he was a historical philosopher, in my view. I think he was a I, I think he was a philosopher all his life, and and uh, I think that the going back to the original clip, I think he remained a child at heart philosophically, and he remained just as fascinated by these questions about time and whatever uh, as he always was. So uh, I, I, I don't think he stopped being a philosopher, no. And, and just very slightly to interject here, the, mm. dis the idea that there is a distinction between philosophy that deals with abstract topics and philosophy that deals with a history of ideas is itself a rather Anglo-Saxon one. Yep. And it's very Germanic, Germano-Russian, to mm. think of philosophy as philosophical concepts as necessarily incorporating their history. <laughs> so in a sense, that was part of what I was getting at before when mm. I suggested that when he came here, he brought with him a different tradition which enriched ours, which was getting pretty narrow at the time. Mm. Uh, yes, there was one other gentleman at the back who's been waiting for ages. Yes, sir. Um, coming back to the very first question that was asked of you, um, did he have any notion of a god at all? No, um, he didn't. Uh, well, what he said was that he didn't understand what God meant. He thought that uh, there were people who understood what the word God meant and believed in him, and they were theists. There were people who understood what God meant and didn't believe in him, and they were atheists. And there were people who understood what God meant and weren't sure whether he existed or not, and those were agnostics. But he said that a new category was required for people like him who simply didn't understand what the term meant. He said, either, he said God is either an old man with a white beard, as in Michelangelo's painting, and that was obviously absurd, or else, what was he, some sort of creative spiritual force which underlay our existence. He didn't, un he didn't understand that at all. It, it, he said it's like being somebody who is tone deaf and doesn't therefore understand music. He sees all these people in going to concerts and enjoying music, but it doesn't make any sense to him because to, hit, to, the, to him it's just meaningless noise. So that was his attitude. He, he, said, he, he said he thought he understood the religious, the religious emotion. He understood why people were moved in what was, could be called a religious or spiritual way by, for example, great music, Bach or Beethoven's late quartets. Um, so, and he thought that he did understand why religion was important to people, but he himself couldn't participate in it for that reason. Yeah. We're allowed to go on a bit longer, though, we, though we've had the hour, so... Mm. Um, can I? Okay, you've got the microphone, all right. I think maybe we can ask very brief questions and have some brief it's answers. It's brief, okay. but we can hear the affection and the warmth in what you have been telling us. Mm -hmm. It's come through very, very strongly. If he was here today, and with his connections all over the world, and with his time in America, and those that he knew, what do you think and how would he deal or say to the incumbent in the White House today? I think it's a very dangerous uh, business to try and second guess what somebody, to, to try and say what somebody would say if he was alive, who can say? But I think in this particular case, um, I think uh, it's safe to say that he would be deeply appalled by the incumbent of the White House, as indeed many people are. Uh. Gentlemen. Is Isaiah, the, um, Isaiah Berlin the inventor of the concept of plural values or pluralism, or was it in, uh, muted before? Good question. Uh, I think the answer to that is both. Uh, that's to say, I think he sort of invented it for himself as a result of his own reading. But there are other people who had articulated very similar things before. 
uh, and uh, they tended to be people he hadn't read. <laughs> so uh, it's hard to say, it, it would be hard to argue that he was influenced directly by them. Um, James Fitz, James Stephen is one, uh, Max Weber is another, um, and, and there are other... Nietzsche. What? No, it doesn't matter. Yeah, okay. I mean, <laughs> one, one could produce... If you go onto the website which I set up for him, there's a, there's a, a, there's a whole page devoted to pluralism which lists all the people who've talked pluralistically before him. So that's what you should look at. Uh, lady in the second row. Uh, thanks. Um, you said that one of his most uh, values that he uh, loved the most was, uh, or valued the most, was the positive freedom to, or um, to be able to do anything that you wanted, etc. And I think that sort of value today has been often kind of adopted by neoliberalism to kind of justify, especially in the US, I'm American, uh, sort of deregulation, la lack of state sort of regulation for all sorts of things. Do you think, in, since he was a historian of ideas, that if you were living today, he would sort of move, he would have a different sort of um, opinion about what would be the most valued sort of philosophical uh, t thing of their time? Does that make sense? Sorry, I know it's a very long sentence, but I'm just saying I get the feeling that because he was so humanistic, I think his sort of value of the of, of a positive liberty was as a result of his being born in the Soviet Union, and it was very specific reaction to that time and space. Uh, but that idea now today has been sort of taken over by sort of economic liberalism that has just used it as justification to kind of deregulate and you, and produce a lot of I would say suffering. So do you think his ideas would have evolved differently if he was living today? My problem with this question is that I'm, my hearing is not wonderful and I missed about 70% oh, of that. So would you like to sum, sum, summarize it for me? I, w I wouldn't dare. No. Well, <laughs> I, I, th I, th I genuinely I don't know what you're asking, but, but not because you didn't ask it clearly, but because I simply couldn't I hear what you I think the question say. was something to do with what he would say about the extent to which liberalism has been taken today, especially in an economic direction. Is that, is that right? Okay. Well, it's been taken to, what, to, to, to well, a reasonably excessive So the idea, you know, of these yeah. totally free markets where people can be thrown out of work tomorrow, they can we reduce social security, that, that sort of idea, right? Yes, well, he, wouldn't, he was against that. He was, uh, he, he was uh, because he, just because he believed in negative freedom uh, so strongly, which he did, it doesn't mean he didn't uh, support um, more positive uh, interventions. And uh, he was always a believer in the welfare state. In the America, he supported the New Deal. So he wasn't a kind of extreme um, laissez-faireist at all. There's a gentleman in the fourth, third row. Mm. Fourth or third row. And then David. Thank you. There's a wonderful passage oh, in the David. book where you describe going down to the cellar of, Be of Berlin's house and seeing the full horror of all these accumulated papers strewn mm. everywhere. And I wonder if you could just say something about that moment and then your role in actually turning this m mass of papers into all these extraordinary books. Mm. Well, the first stage of my work for Berlin was collecting his mostly published essays into um, thematically organized volumes. So there was no, no particular um, intellectual archaeology involved at that stage, although it did involve finding out what he'd written, which uh, was something he didn't know. <laughs> but uh, towards the, uh, a bit later on, after all that had happened, he revised his will and asked if I would be one of his literary executors. And I said to him, well, of course I'm interested, but I would like to see what it is I'd have to deal with. I mean, I don't, I don't know what the size of the problem is. And he said, okay, come to my house and, and look at my papers. So I did that, and, and that meant going through the whole house from, there were some papers in the attic, there were several rooms which were full of had filing cabinets and so on, and then there was this cellar underneath the house. And I do remember going down into that for the first time and being, as you say, appalled by the volume of material that was there. He, he, never, uh, he never actively preserved anything. He didn't keep things in a, in a conscious way, but he never threw anything away either. He just sort of 
boxed it up and put it in a cupboard or, or sent it down to the, the cellar or whatever it might be, or put it in a suitcase. And I remember the first day I spent in the cellar and I just went quickly through everything and it took a whole day even to go quickly through just skimming and dipping into things. And I found, uh, on the first day, I found a, a large number of obviously completed essays or lectures which, uh, whose existence I was completely unaware of and whose existence he had completely forgotten. And indeed, when I produced some of them and showed them to him, he tried to deny that he'd written them. <laughs> uh, but uh, the evidence was irresistible in the end. So I, I, sudden, I was sort of both exhilarated and terrified by this because I realised that I'd open a, a Pandora's box. I thought I would just be doing a little bit of tidying up of this and that, but here there was a whole, a whole new world, a whole, the potential for several volumes of, of work which had never been seen by anybody but him before. And that was, it was terrifying because I realised that there were years and years of work here and indeed it took me from the beginning to the end of, of my work on, on Berlin, it, not that it's completely finished even now, but it was 40 years work. And uh, that was appalling prospect. <laughs> <laughs> but exhilarating too. Mm. I've been getting ever more vehement signals from the back <laughs> to wrap this up, which I do with great regret because there's a lady in the front row who would like to ask a question. Perhaps we can do Please this afterwards. Come and ask it personally I, afterwards. I do feel <laughs> under, under orders from the yes. management to, I, I think I'm going to, to bring this to an end. So, so can we thank Henry for magnificently bringing us out of the